Dr. Michael Wesley, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the University of Melbourne, to this wonderful law school building, to hear a significant public lecture by one of the nation's leading authorities on international relations and Australia's relations with the Asia-Pacific region, Dr. Michael Wesley. My name is John Dewar. I'm the acting Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne. And I'd like to begin tonight's proceedings in the customary way by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Now, we are recording tonight's lecture and the question and answer session that will follow. So could I ask you to switch off all mobile phones and pages and any other device that might burst noisily into life at an unexpected moment? Um, and keep them switched off until we've concluded the question and answer session. Tonight, Dr. Wesley will speak to us about Australia's security and prosperity in the light of the China boom, an important topic on which he is extremely well qualified to speak. Indeed, Michael is one of the most compelling public voices in debate within Australia about its international relationships and its relationships in particular with our region. Michael is the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute for International Policy. He's also a Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution and an Adjunct Professor at Griffith University and the University of Sydney and was a former, former Director of the Griffith Asia Institute. In a much travelled <coughs> career, Dr Wesley has graduated from the University of New South Wales and took his PhD at St Andrews University in Scotland. He's worked as a senior lecturer in international relations at his alma mater, UNSW, and also worked for the government as assistant director general for transnational issues at the Office of National Assessments in Canberra. He's been a visiting professor at the University of Hong Kong and at Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou in China. He's the author of several influential books, including The Howard Paradox, Australian Diplomacy in Asia, which explored the legacy of the Howard and Downey years in advancing a practical regionalism agenda for Australia in Asia, in Asia. Most recently, Dr. Wesley has sounded something of a warning blast to Australians in his book, There Goes the Neighbourhood, Australia and the Rise of Asia, published earlier this year in May by UNSW Press. That book makes a powerful case for a much stronger public engagement and debate about Australia's place in the region and the world. And indeed, just recently, the book There Goes the Neighbourhood was named winner of the John Button Prize for the best piece of thinking and writing on public policy for 2011. And in connection with that award, I'd now like specially to acknowledge Mr James Button, director of the John Button Foundation, who I'm delighted is here this evening. As one of the sponsors of the John Button Prize, the University of Melbourne hosts a lecture by each year's prize winner, and tonight's lecture by Dr. Wesley is the 2011 John Button Prize Lecture. So I ask you now to offer a warm welcome to Professor Wesley, Dr. Wesley, to deliver the lecture, Australia and the China Boom. Please welcome Dr. Michael Wesley. Particular pleasure to be here. It's a particular pleasure to, uh, uh, to be introduced by you. Um, what John didn't mention is that, that, uh, that it was he who, uh, who hired me to Griffith University, uh, the biggest mistake he ever made. Can I also uh, add uh, my, uh, my words of, uh, of, of welcome to James Button? Uh, I think the, uh, the John Button Foundation does uh, fantastic work in promoting better debate and conversations around public policy in Australia. For the, for the past four years, the Lowy Institute has asked Australians whether they believe that China's growth has been good for Australia as part of our annual Lowy poll on Australia and the world. In 2008, 63% agreed that China's growth has been good for Australia. In 2010, 73% agreed with that proposition. And this year, 75% of Australians said that China's growth has been good for Australia. 
We also asked, pe asked the people we polled which country they thought was the world's leading economic power. For two years running, 2010 and 2011, 55% answered China, compared to 30% with the United States and 10% for the EU. Wherever you look in Australia, the China boom is never far from the front of the public mind. China is now strongly ensconced as our major trading partner, taking over one quarter of our exports and supplying just under one fifth of our imports. These trading links meant that during the global financial crisis, Australia's economic fortunes tracked those of China and benefited from Beijing's huge stimulus package of 2008, rather than following the economic fortunes of the United States and Europe. China's huge, huge surge of industrialisation and infrastructure investment has delivered the largest terms of trade boost in Australia's history. Australia's terms of trade, or the, quali or, or the quantity of imports that can be paid for by a given quantity of exports, are now 65% higher than Australia's 20th, 20th century terms of trade average, and 90% above their average level during the 1990s. As Reserve Bank Governor Glenn Stevens put it recently, in 2005, a shipload of Australian iron ore earned enough to buy 2,200 flat screen TVs. By 2010, that same shipload could, could pay for 22,000 flat screen TVs. The arrival of China on Australia's economic horizons has been remarkably rapid. In 1995, Australian trade with China, uh, sorry, trade with China constituted less than 5% of Australia's total trade. Today, it constitutes over 22% of our total trade. A market that today takes one quarter of Australia's total exports took less than 5% of our exports in 1995. For those who cared to watch closely, the first rumblings of the Chinese economic tsunami could be heard as early as 1993. That was the year that China, historically one of the world's largest oil producers, became a net oil importer. What happened with oil soon happened with other commodities. The incredible scale of China's economic development had by the end of the 1990s outstripped the ability of China's, China's huge mineral and energy reserves to supply booming domestic demand. Over a four-year period, roughly between 1998 and 2002, China's demand for minerals and energy mopped up excess global supply that had been building up since the 1970s. Suddenly, resource producers, which had been disinvesting in mineral production for decades, watching commodity prices in the doldrums and struggling to compete for investment with the new economy found themselves struggling to meet China's demand. Australia, through luck rather than through design, happened to be in the front row. Actually, there were two strokes of luck involved here. The first was Australia's unique geological heritage, possession of a continent that is divided into three vertical segments each of different geological ages and geological compositions, which means that it is a full spectrum supplier of minerals and energy to the world. There are only a handful of industrial minerals for which Australia is not in the top five global suppliers or holders. The second stroke of luck was our location. China's greatest hunger was and is for, for iron ore. Why? Well, in 1990, China produced just over 50,000 tonnes of steel products. Now it produces more than that volume of steel every single month. Virtually all of that is consumed in China, building cities and infrastructure. Now iron ore is a, is a very heavy, bulky commodity. Transporting it makes up a significant proportion of the cost to the importer particularly as global energy markets tighten. Australian iron ore is not 
of as high quality as Brazilian iron ore, but it's much closer and therefore cheaper to ship to China. Indian iron ore is closer to China than Australia's, but is not anywhere near the same quality. So thanks to our geology and geography, Australia has been arguably the country that has most benefited from the China boom. In economic terms, the China boom came along and changed Australia's long-run economic fortunes almost overnight, reversing a long-term structural decline in Australia's terms of trade. Reserve Bank analysis shows that before the, the China boom, global commodity prices were in long-term decline, halving in comparison to consumer or GDP prices and falling by a quarter against manufacturing prices over the course of the 20th century. Well, currently, thanks to the China boom, our terms of trade are about 85% above the level they would, be, they would be at if for the last 10 years they had followed the same downward trajectory they have during the 20th century. The Grattan Institute's Saul Eslake has calculated that this has translated into an increase in, Australia, in Australian real per capita disposable income of more than $3,600 per year, lifting Australians' average wealth to eighth in the world, back where they were, back where we were in the golden era of the late 1950s and early 1960s. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the most prominent face of the China boom. A boom that has underwritten the second decade of a remarkable period of national prosperity in Australia that began in the early 1990s. But just to see the China boom in terms of prosperity is short-sighted in the extreme. What I want to argue this evening is that the implications of the China boom for Australia are much more complex and challenging than simply a question of how we're going to spend all of this money. Some of these implications are already apparent. One obvious effect is that the gravitational pull of China's economy is reshaping the Australian economy. Some economists have theorised that there is a law of gravity in international economics, just as there is in physics. Gravity models in international economics theorise that the volume of trade between two countries is an increasing function of the size of their economies and a decreasing function of the distance between them. In other words, there is a reinforcing cycle between growing trade between two economies and the consequent increase in their economic size. A side product is their increasing gravitational effect on reshaping each other, which as my Lowy Institute colleague Mark Thurwell argues, can be exerted through terms of trade, perceptions and business confidence, exchange rates, flows of investment, stock exchanges and interest rates. Take Australia's exchange rate. Oops, there we go. Because of our trade with China, global money markets have decided that the Australian dollar is a proxy for their judgments about the health of the Chinese economy. This, plus the level of Australia's interest rates in relation to those of the major developed economies, has seen the exchange rate rise to 25% above its post-float average on a trade-weighted basis. The result has been the flatlining of Australia's exports of manufactured goods and services since the mid-2000s, after a decade of 10% year-on-year growth in the 1990s. The exchange rate has been a major factor in the 12% fall in domestic tourism accommodation since 2005, despite an overall 10% increase in, Australia, in the Australian population over that period, and a significant slowing in inbound tourism. The effects of China's gravitational pull on the Australian economy can be seen in the employment figures as well. Employment has grown strongly in the resources sector as well as in related ancillary services, engineering, project management, legal and accounting services and information technology. But the story is very different in other sectors. In a recent speech, Malcolm Turnbull calculates that while total employment in Australia grew by 24% between 1990 and 2011, it grew by a meagre 15% in the traded sectors of the economy, compared to a 58% increase 
in, the economies, uh, in, in employment in the economy's non-traded sectors. The anxieties of the sectors most affected by the exchange rate and the terms of trade have been played out in the media and the parliament in recent months. Perhaps understandably, these anxieties have been couched in terms of workers and business within those sectors and in terms of the national economy. But what seems to have been lost in the conversation is the extent to which China's gravitational reshaping of economies is not just a phenomenon that is confined to Australia. It is a region-wide phenomenon. Over the past decade, Australia, uh, China has established itself at the centre of a system of tightly integrated distributed production in Asia that economists have started calling Factory Asia. Factory Asia has arisen from the response of East and Southeast Asian countries, and more importantly from multinational corporations, to China's rise as an industrial power. The response from China's neighbours has been to transform into manufacturers of component parts for products, uh, most of which are assembled in China and then shipped to the rest of the world. Component parts increased from just over one half of Southeast Asia's manufacturing exports in 1992-93 to two thirds in 2006-2007. Meanwhile, the share of components in China's total manufacturing imports from East Asia jumped from just 16% in 1992-93 to 46% in 2006-2007. The tightness of Asia's economic integration with China can be seen in just how closely Asia's economies tracked the performance of the Chinese economy during the global financial crisis. It can also be seen in the pronounced effect of an isolated occurrence on the production chains in the region. The Fukushima earthquake earlier this year, for instance, caused a 10% drop in vehicle production, motor vehicle production across Asia in the ensuing months. The result of all of this is that China has become a major trading partner with all of the region's major economies. Currently, six of APEC's 21 members have China as their number one trading partner. Another five have China in their top three, and a, and a further four have China in their top five. We would be naive in the extreme to believe that this remarkable reshaping of the regional economic order and the gravitational reshaping of national economies is simply a story of win-win prosperity. Centuries of human history have established that wealth and power are ultimately indistinguishable as national goals. Each supports and cannot long endure without the other. Sixty years ago, the great international political economist Albert Hirschman coined the concept of the influence effect of foreign trade, by which he meant the circumstances in which trade leads to relationships of dependence and influence among nations. In his seminal 1945 work, National Power and the Structure of Foreign Trade, Hirschman argued that where one country is able to change the economic structure of another to make it highly complementary to its own, a relationship of profound dependence and influence is created. Building on Hirschman, it's possible to argue that relations of asymmetric specialisation have developed between China and its neighbours, by which I mean that China's scale has allowed it to maintain a reasonably diversified economy and trading profile, while its neighbours' economies are increasingly restructured around and dependent on their trade with China. It doesn't matter whether this is the result of a conscious strategy for, from Beijing. Indeed, I think that is highly unlikely. What matters is that situation exists, and it exists now. Even if Beijing didn't notice this situation, again a highly likely assumption, or chose not to try to manipulate it, it still accords China remarkable influence in this region. Just think for a moment about the concentration of sovereign risk, the number of countries that would suffer if the Chinese economy stalled or fell apart suddenly. 
In other words, pretty much every country in this region has a major stake in the ongoing success of the Chinese economy. And this stake is growing as Europe and America look set for a decade, at least, of stagnant growth. Ask yourself, if another Tiananmen Square massacre happened tomorrow, how many countries in the region, or for that matter the world, would break off their trade and investment relationship with China? But we need to go further and ask to ask how a region-wide system of asymmetric specialisation between China and its neighbours will shape the region in which we live. These charts show just how profoundly regional manufacturing economies have specialised towards component manufactures and exports to China. It's a very familiar pattern. On the other hand, this, this next chart shows that while China's top five import sources supply just over half of its imports, only two are in the East Asian region, or three if you include Australia. There are other Austra uh, Asian economies in China's top 15 import sources, but cumulatively they supply a small proportion of China's imports. Now there is, ver there is little evidence that China has tried very hard to use this leverage to date. In fact, it's highly likely that China has not yet worked out how to effectively use this economic leverage. A year ago, following the detainment of a Chinese fishing boat captain by Japan, China slept, slapped an embargo on the export of rare earth metals to Japan. At the time, China supplied 95% of the, of the world's trade in rare earth elements, which are crucial for the manufacture of mobile phones, batteries, wind turbines, catalytic converters and the like. Now Beijing got its fishing captain back, but at a pretty high price. The global alarm at China's dominance of rare earth elements, supplies and its willingness to embargo their export has, stimula has stimulated a surge in rare earth element production in other countries. Contrary to their name, rare earth elements are not particularly rare in the earth's crust, but they are messy and dangerous to extract. So on this occasion, China used a source of economic leverage but at the cost of burning that source of its leverage. But there are signs that more subtle forms of leverage may be at hand. Taiwan is currently watching a free trade negotiation between China and Korea very nervously. Taiwan and Korea basically, uh, are basically direct competitors in supplying component parts into the Chinese economy. If Beijing decides to give Korea much more favor favorable trading terms than it gives Taiwan, this could have a major health uh, impact on Taiwan's economic health. Another example might be as China's workforce increases in technological sophistication, China may have the option of making its own component parts. An offer by Beijing to forestall its move, uh, a move by its firms into com components manufacturing could be highly compelling to a country whose industry would be heavily affected if that were to happen. So the China boom could have significant regional effects with big implications for Australia. But has China's gravitational pull set up a relationship of asymmetric specialisation with Australia? We can see here the effect of the China boom on the different sectors of our economy. We can see the level of Chinese investment that is pouring into our commodities sector. But at this stage, I don't think it's possible to say that Australia has moved into an asymmetric relationship with China on the trade front. China does account for one quarter of the exports of our very trade dependent economy. But this is still below the level of trade dependence on one economy that developed uh, between Australia and Japan in the 1970s and 1980s. There are also promising signs that there are other emerging sources of demand for Australia's minerals and energy. 
So while asymmetric uh, specialisation is not affecting Australia at the moment, it is something that needs to be watched closely within our economy and more broadly in the regional economy. So those are the economic and strategic effects of the China boom on Australia and its region. But I'd like to finish up this evening by talking briefly about what I think are the political effects of the China boom, the most significant effects which are political. Now my observations here flow from thinking about the effects of two decades of uninterrupted prosperity on our national psyche. Just over 30, 30 years ago, two psychologists named Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman published an article showcasing their findings from experiments with how human beings make decisions under different circumstances. Their work revolutionised the field of economics and earned them a joint Nobel Prize in economics. Because they showed that humans aren't just rational computers making decisions based on dry utility calculations. They showed that emotions, the animal spirits that Keynes speculated about, are very big determinants on the choices that people make. Now their central conclusion may not sound groundbreaking. It was that essentially people don't like losing. But it has really interesting effects. It means that, uh, that some of the implications are that when things are going well, when people are winning, they become less and less willing to risk, to take risks, to e even further increase their games, their gains, even if taking the risk promises even greater payoffs. On the other hand, when things are going badly, when they're losing, people become more willing to take the most extraordinary risks in order to try and recoup what they've just lost. These insights are incredibly powerful in explaining a range of phenomenon from, uh, from the insurance industry to problem gamblers. But I think they also uh, provide great insights into how politics works and particularly how uh, economic circumstances affects the way that politics works in democratic systems. A few years ago, Ken Henry reflected on his experience in the policy making world and he drew on some of, of Tversky's and Kahneman's conclusions. In politics, he argued, quote, penalties and rewards are not scored symmetrically. Losses are valued much more heavily than gains, unquote. I think Henry is right and I think this risk aversion gets more pronounced when things are going well in the national economy. In other words, the better the economy is faring, the less willing governments become to take risks. I think there are several contributing factors to this. One is the nature of oppositional systems of government and the free media. Bad news always outpolls and outrates good news. Success is easily attributed to a range of factors. Failures or failure always leads to a witch hunt for someone to blame. While the story of generalised benefits to the whole community uh, is hard to tell and sell, the stories about the losses to individuals make great news copy. The stories of the losers from any reform are much starker when sketched against a backdrop of general community prosperity. I think there is yet another side of the China boom story in some of these observations. Australia has just experienced the most extraordinary boom era over the past 20 years, making us richer than we've ever been. A big part of this story is the China boom. But as we've become richer, so we've lost over time the ability to plan and ready ourselves for the future. <coughs> Rarely has this country experienced such a cacophony of different opinions about what needs to be done in planning for our future. Never before have we seen such powerful and well-resourced public opposition campaigns <coughs> to reform measures launched by governments on both sides of politics. It's as if a collective fear has settled over Australia that something will happen that will take away these boom times. Combined with an individual fear that somehow the system is being gamed to shut individuals or sectors out of the boom times. 
the loss of reform and long-term planning will has a deeper and more pernicious effect as well. I think our sense of self has been affected by the China boom. In the 1990s, we'd started to feel good about ourselves. There was a sense of confidence and achievement that flowed from the tough reforms that we'd endured and we'd undertaken during the 1980s and 1990s. There was a sense that we'd made the tough decisions. We'd reformed ourselves to make the most of the global economy. We'd gone, gone from some of the highest tariff barriers in the world to some of the lowest. The second round of these being in the midst of a recession. We'd floated, deregulated, legislated and remade our own fortunes. Productivity in the early 1990s was the highest for decades. Manufacturing and services were growing. We were leading the Asia Pacific towards open free trade regionalism. I think the high point of our sense of achievement and confidence came during the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98, when Australia kept growing while the Asian tigers floundered. To use psychological jargon again, Australians had a strong internal locus of control, a sense that we made our own luck, we controlled our own destiny. I think the China boom has eroded this sense, this internal locus of control. Sure, the China boom has made us richer, but it's also made us aware that we've done well not because of who we are, but because of what we have. The riches of the China boom are not about us making our own luck and controlling our own destiny. They're about the mineral wealth in the soil beneath our feet and the success of an economy to our north that wants what's in the soil beneath our feet. In psych jargon terms again, the China boom has externalised our locus of control. Someone else is the author of our fortune and therefore someone else will be the author of our misfortune too. This is a deeply pernicious national mindset. It means we watch China's growth figures anxiously without thinking hard about what we should be doing when those growth figures flatten or fall. It means we indulge ourselves in bitter partisan debates without thinking about their effect on our collective ability to change ourselves because we think that the China boom will get us through eventually. It is this aspect of the China boom, ladies and gentlemen, the effect on Australia's political culture that is the most dangerous because without addressing it, we can't hope to face up to the other aspects of the China boom. All winning, ends, all winning runs come to an end, but surprisingly few gamblers seem to realise it. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much. I said it was a warning blast, um, and I think you're willing now to take some questions for which we have plenty of time. So please feel free to ask Michael questions, which I'm sure you have, yes. Um, as you probably know, the spot price of iron ore dropped to 157.30. Within three years, it's pos quite feasible to be looking at 60 or 70 bucks a ton. So then do you think we'll be going into being the riskier side of assessing the situation? Well, quite possibly. Um, certainly if iron ore prices fall that, that low, uh, a lot of the, the, the effects on terms of trade and, and, and other things will, um, will be reversed. Um, uh, eventually, the China boom will come to an end. Uh, the debate is on it should be on how long it will last rather than you know uh, uh, whether or not it will last. It will come to an end. And, uh, and I think that is the, the most compelling thing that we as a nation face. Are we prepared as an economy, as a society, uh, to look beyond, to have used uh, what we've gained? Are we using what we've gained from the China boom effectively to build uh, our capacity to make the most of the world beyond Asia's economic boom, even if India comes online and, and begins to, uh, to, to, to mop up some of the supply created by the China boom if China's uh, uh, demand starts to fall? And I guess that's, that's the big question that I have. Ultimately, um, 
I think that uh, ultimately, uh, I think that, that hard times will be necessary before we start to take some of these uh, reform questions seriously and, and, and really seriously the, bef before both sides of politics stop trying to score partisan points from, uh, from what are very big uh, reform issues and questions. Um, and so I think, uh, I think ultimately, um, you know, we are an economy that will go through cycles of reform just as we go through economic cycles of boom and bust. And I think that is probably going to be something that we, we sketch out into our future. Thank you, Michael. Yes. As the China boom tapers off 20, about 20 years from now, in the, the, India, the demand from India will pick up. So the sort of hard times that y you are saying are needed might be 30 years away. Sure. So in the intervening 30 years, can and what should be done what should um, politicians and policymakers do in that time, or are the, are the historical and structural forces just too great to actually achieve, you know, substantial reform? Well, I mean, the the pessimistic answer to your question, James, would be uh, quite possibly. Um, one of the things that um, I think has been most disturbing in recent years is that um, policy debate um, and really impassioned opposition. To, uh, to reform questions has occurred outside of the national parliament. It certainly occurred within parliament, but we've had these big, well-resourced campaigns from both sides of politics, arguably starting with the work choices, uh, anti-work choices campaign. Um, and they've had a real effect on our ability to, to reform and to make policy, uh, whether, you, whether you agree with those um, policies or not. Arguably, the parliament is there to decide whether they can be done or not. Um, it, it, it seriously worries me and I don't think it's, it's stretching things too much to suggest that um, Australia is manifesting quite, quite a widespread tr trend in this region of frustration with uh, the mechanisms of parliamentary democracy and taking democracy to the streets, taking protests to the streets. Um, it, it's probably slightly dramatising it but you know, we've seen uh, protest and opposition taken to the streets, delegitimisation of governments taken to the streets in Thailand in recent years, uh, in, in, uh, in Korea, in Malaysia. Uh, and uh, it does have, I think, a corrosive effect on the institutions of policy making at the heart of our political system, the parliament uh, and cabinet. Um, so whether that's related to our national prosperity or whether it's related to the rise of new media, to, uh, to public campaigns in places like the United States. It's probably a bit of all of that. I think uh, uh, if Saul's right and if the boom continues for decades, um, what I think we need is a collective act of political will uh, within our political system of, uh, of our uh, parliamentarians on both sides saying that, you know, let's, let's keep opposition and advocacy within bounds. Let's not use these extra parliamentary uh, processes to bolster our own case because I really do think this sort of uh, deeply oppositional politics is tearing apart our ability to reform properly. I mean, the, uh, the great uh, reforms of the 80s and 90s that uh, your, your father was very much a part of, uh, a lot of them were, got, got bipartisan support. And I think... Um, uh, a lot of the explanation for, for that came from the sense of shock that Australia had from the 1970s when the, the long boom had come from, f to an end and there was a sense <coughs> of really not knowing what to do with uh, employment, unemployment high, inflation high, the economy in the doldrums. Um, and I think a lot of that bipartisan commitment, that bounding of economic debate came from the shock of that period. And, Without uh, another shock in the, in the near-term future, it's going to take an act of political will and reconciliation in, in, in our politics to, to, to bring it back into a, a more rational form of, of, of debate and discussion. Yes. That's oh, okay. Um, um, if you wouldn't mind, just so I'd like to get your view on the criticism that's um, been levelled at, uh, I guess, governments that have 
that they've squandered the boom, that uh, instead of spending money on things like infrastructure, um, education, things that you know go towards productivity, they've largely um, basically given it back to households in ta tax cuts, who have then gone to the banks, leveraged up, and used it to inflate housing prices. Mm. So yeah, what's your view on that? Look, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to that view. Um, I do think that uh, we are not really acting strategically in terms of the uh, um, the, the the boom that's that's been created. Um, I happen to agree with people who advocate uh, some form of sovereign wealth fund, uh, storing up the wealth for use in the future. Uh, you know, it's not rocket science. Other countries have done it. Countries much smaller than Australia have done it and done it successfully. Um, my uh, the the other part of it is that I, I also think that there are uh, the, the the other great difference I think now from the early 1980s was that by the time the Hawke uh, government started reforming the economy, there was there seemed to be uh, quite a strong consensus among economists and opinion makers about what needed to be done to the economy, and so. Um, I'm not saying that there was a there was a, a, a dance card or a, or a you know act, action sheet, but there was a, a strong sense of of um, of a, a collective will or a collective mind about what happened, uh, what needed to be done. I don't perceive that uh, at the moment. There is a great sense of disagreement about what the reform agenda should be. There are some who argue that the reform agenda should be labour market deregulation. There are others who argue that the reform agenda should be uh, an NBN. Uh, there are others who argue that the reform sh agenda should centre around a carbon tax. So there is a great deal of, of disagreement at the moment and uh, arguably the disagreement has become partisan. So uh, whatever one side puts up, the other side will, will oppose. Um, I happen to think that uh, that the, the big building for the future that needs to be done in the Australian economy uh, is actually on the knowledge sectors of the economy. That is where I think the, the global economy has moved to and will move further to. Uh, the Asian region um, I think is becoming more and more uh, a centre of gravity in terms of global innovation and global research and Australia really needs to build its capacity to, to hook into those uh, those sectors of the new economy contribute to them and benefit from them. And I, I, don't, I don't see any coherent uh, uh, reform agenda around the knowledge economy uh, beyond the odd, you know, um, foray into things like the NBN. Yes. Um, just touching on your sovereign wealth fund um, comment, mm. would it not be simpler just to make infrastructure projects via the um, Australian Infrastructure Organisation attractive enough for superannuation funds and the future funds to invest in? Because a sovereign wealth fund would be investing on the same <coughs> basis. Um, but my actual question before I got to that was, with China is arguably the most influential yet dependent um, on other countries' world power in history, to my knowledge. The UK, the US, they were not, not as dependent, I guess, or interlinked with the world as China is. Um, so what sort of world power do you think it will actually be, given this um, sense of globalisation with it? Mm. Um, on the first question, uh, look, I think, um, I, I'm not a specialist in this, uh, in this area, but um, my my own impression is that, that a sovereign wealth fund that it invested not only onshore but offshore as well would be a good way of, of controlling the inflationary effects of, of the China boom and so on. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll leave it to, uh, to others to, to argue on that. What sort of great power will China be? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that kind of, is China more dependent than Great Britain or, or the United States was? Um, I think in terms of investment, Great Britain was very dependent on the world in terms of its wealth. Um, but, uh, but I, I mean, again, I'm not a, an economic historian, so I'm not going to go into that. What I will say is that China will be a very different great power because China will be a very poor great power. Uh, even if you believe the projections, even when the Chinese economy in aggregate terms is, bigger, is the biggest in the world, is bigger than that of the United States, in per capita terms, if you, if you do the numbers, 
uh, the Chinese uh, will be in per capita terms about as wealthy as Egyptians are today. So it will be a very middle income great power and that will be unique in history. We've never had a poor great power before and if India joins it we'll have two of them. So um, that means that uh, you know, they will see the world in very different ways. They will expect things in very different ways. They will see their stewardship of global affairs in different ways. And, uh, and that has very big implications for a small rich country within China's orbit like Australia. It will mean that, uh, uh, to quote uh, a piece of Lowy Institute research, um, uh, we put out a report uh, earlier this year looking at Chinese perceptions on investing in Australia. And there's really quite a, a, a divide between what the Chinese see the Australian investment uh, climate as being and what we see the Australian investment climate as being. If you ask 10 Australian uh, economic commentators uh, about Australia as an investment uh, uh, climate, um, I think 10, and if not 10, 9, would say that Australia is a very welcoming and open investment climate. They will quote the number of Chinese investment proposals that are simply waved through the Foreign Investment Review Board. But when you go and ask the Chinese, they see things very differently. They see Australia as highly discriminatory against Chinese investment. Um, and what's interesting in that report is that they say a lot of the Chinese uh, that were interviewed for it um, said that Australia is discriminatory against Chinese investment in the same way that most other Western countries are. So they see us as part of a global system of rich white people keeping the Chinese out of top tier assets. Now that arguably is a very big perception problem. Whether it's true or not is not the question, it's the perception that matters. And as China becomes more powerful and feels itself uh, uh, able to demand more things in the global economy, I think we're going to be in the front line of some of those demands. So this is, a, this is going to be a very great, different great power and we need to start thinking about some of these things. Professor Garno. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, really, following uh, James's uh, comment, is that uh, China's boom can keep going very strongly for a couple of decades, and Australia's China boom not. Uh, in fact, uh, that's a very likely uh, outcome, uh, simply because of the supply response of high uh, commodity prices, sure, uh, sure. which will bring down commodity prices while Chinese demand still growing very strongly, mm -hmm. uh, foreshadowed by the comment that was made about the, uh, the fall in the iron ore price. Um, uh, so uh, uh, um, China's growth is going to keep coming, its relative weight, its exercise of asymmetric power is going to increase. You really duck the question by saying, well, up till now, uh, China's uh, no more influential Sure. proportionally than Japan was 30 years ago, sure. but, uh, but Japan was at its peak. China mm. will still be going for two or three decades. Yeah. Uh, uh, China will be a poor great power when it exceeds the United States in total economic size in a few years' time in purchasing power terms, but it will keep growing yeah. and it will be a rich great power in every sense a couple of decades after that. Uh, so uh, I'd like to push you on the question of uh, uh, asymmetric power, China's weight in the international system, its weight relative to the United States yep. Yep. Uh, into the future uh, and uh, ask you uh, what, if anything, should be done about it. <laughs> uh, well, I'm certainly not going to advocate trying to stop it. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's uh, I think you're right, Ross, um, uh, in terms of, of the, the China boom continuing in China and, and not quite continuing in Australia. I mean, one of the reasons that, uh, what, one of the two reasons I wrote um, the book that I've just published is that I wanted to take a snapshot of Australia now because I, 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 I keep getting the feeling that this, this period of prosperity is coming to an end, that, you know, this, that we will look back on this period of prosperity and, and just marvel at how good we had it and how li little we did with it. Um, 
So I think you're absolutely right. China, um, I, I'm going to push your point a little bit because I think you're right. I think you're right. But I think we need to be ready for China being a much more multi-dimensional great power than it is at the moment as well. China at the moment we look at as this economic behemoth and this growing military behemoth as well. But there are other kind of forms of power I think that are coming. I think we need to prepare ourselves for a time which is I don't think very far away when the Shanghai Stock Exchange becomes um, you know, the equivalent uh, position in the global financial system that New York plays today. That sort of size and depth and scale of capital markets means that, sh that Shanghai is the, is the stock exchange that everyone looks to. And in that world, the Mumbai Stock Exchange may play the same role that perhaps Frankfurt or London play in, the, in global finance today. And with that comes a whole new set of, uh, of power imperatives that don't even have to be exercised consciously to, to have real effect in terms of um, suddenly China becoming a major arbiter in ticking off on uh, merger proposals between major global corporations. Suddenly China uh, becomes one of the big uh, 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 centres of world power that says yes or no to those sorts of proposals. So I think that form of power is coming. I think um, uh, we need to think about cultural power, serious cultural power, that the centres of uh, knowledge and innovation, the centres of fashion and film are no longer New York and Los Angeles and London and Paris, but are Mumbai and Shanghai and Saigon and, uh, and Seoul. And that, uh, that they become the trendsetters, the really creative forces in, in the world economy. And that's a world in which, um, which we're going to find very unfamiliar. You know, at the moment, young Australians grow up and they expect to go to North America and Europe to experience the world, to experience the cutting edge of what's exciting about the world. I think within not too, uh, not the not too far distant future, I think within uh, possibly even by the time my own sons are in their 20s, uh, they will start to see these Asian centres as the places to go to. And I mean, this is obviously going in a very obvious direction, uh, but you know, are we equipping our kids, am I equipping my own sons, uh, to be able to fully participate in these exciting, exciting centres of global innovation and, and cultural uh, change? Um, I don't think we are. You know, I, I really don't think we are. So I think there are some big dimensions of this that we really need to think about. I don't think we have uh, a chance in hell of stopping uh, this growth. Uh, if the growth stops, it will occur from, you know, something going seriously wrong inside China rather than what happens outside of China. But uh, without wanting to go on for too long, one of the things that we haven't been doing here in Australia, we've, I think we've assumed that the China boom is just about us and that we're the only ones affected by the China boom. And I think what we need to realise is that actually the China boom puts us in a very similar situation to a lot of countries that are more our size in the region. I was in Korea last year and was really quite astounded at how um, the Koreans are affected by this growing behemoth next to them. Um, what we should be doing, what we should be doing in a serious way is engaging intellectually with countries around China that have a much longer historical experience of dealing with a powerful China than we do. Arguably Australia is the only country in this region that has never dealt with a powerful China. And we should be listening to them and sharing perspectives with them about what they're doing, how they're seeing it, what their responses are, rather than thinking that we're making uh, our own responses in some sort of, you know, uh, you know we're the only country that, that's required to make responses. Now we have time for one final quick question. Okay. I'd like to challenge you on two points. Sure. I'd like to challenge you on two points. I guess the first one is just the uh, financial China as a financial centre. I think that's ludicrous unless they, um, you know, there's a, I mean, financial markets um, thrive on information flow. There's just no information flow in China. There's suppression of information from from the top down. Financial markets don't work in that type of environment. So, I'd, I'd, so your comments about Shanghai. I'd, I'd, just probably wouldn't agree with. Um, the 
I can, we can address that as well. Um, the, the other point would be the, um, the China boom, I just about the, the, the longevity of that boom in, in relation to, I mean, the game's up in, in many ways in the sense that this funneling of the Chinese surplus into, into the US was, was fine when the US was, was all fine and dandy, but now they've got nine point, you know, now they've got unemployment in excess of 9%. That, that game's up, that, that, that whole idea of, and, and so that whole mercantilist approach that the Chinese have taken in terms of fixing their exchange rate, getting a massive, getting a massive advantage through that, that game's up. And, and whether the US is going to allow, and so you're going to, I'm just interested in your perspective on that, on that trade conflict now, that, the, that the, with, now that the US has a large unemployment rate, whether they're actually going to allow, in fact, you know, this, this game, to, you know, the, the game that has played out over the past decade to continue. Sure. Sorry, sure. not so short. Um, I guess uh, I'll try and answer these very quickly. Um, on, the, on Shanghai as a financial centre, um, I think things to do with the convertibility of the currency and, and, and those, those, uh, those information flows are, are things that the Chinese will work with. They seriously want Shanghai to become a big financial centre. And, and if, anything, if the last... Uh, 30 years tells us anything, when the Chinese want to do something, they, they go ahead and do it and they take painful decisions to do it. On the second question, um, I'll refer to a fascinating chart that came out in a recent Reserve Bank conference um, where someone put up a, a, a chart that tracked uh, the growth rate of the Chinese economy against the, the consensus forecasts of where the Chinese economy was going to go. The first line went like that, and then there was a whole series of lines of people predicting the Chinese economy was going to crash. Um, I'm not a specialist on the Chinese economy. I should hand over to Ross Garno, but um, I believe that all of the problems that people talk about in terms of the Chinese economy are problems that they've dealt with before in terms of bubbles and inflation and in unemployment and so on. And in fact, I understand that they've dealt with these problems in much greater scale before and they've managed through these problems. Whether the, uh, the uh, continuing downturn in the United States affects China is, I guess, a question that we'll, uh, we'll have to watch. I'm told by uh, economists who uh, follow China very closely that the Chinese are actively thinking about how to keep their economy going in the, in the, in the event of long-term downturns in, in Europe and the United States. So I guess in, in the interest of time I'll leave, leave my response there. Michael, thank you very much indeed. Um, in my introduction I said that Michael's book was a, a warning blast and that his voice in public policy debates about Australia's place in the region and its relationship with China was an important one. I think you've amply demonstrated the, the, the justification of those remarks in what you said this evening and in particular in your response to the questions for which I thank you very much indeed. Um, it's true I did hire Michael um, to be director of the Griffith Asia Institute, one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, Michael, on everyone's behalf here tonight, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.